Canadian Positive Psychology Association, and he's going to introduce David. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's uh, an honor uh, this morning to uh, introduce our distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. David uh, Kuprayer. Uh, I first uh, met uh, David on uh, June 16th, uh, 2016. I can actually remember this because uh, um, we were at a CPPA conference in Niagara-on-the-Lake, and, uh, the, uh, uh, and the, the biggest story of the time was the Cleveland Cavaliers, Cavaliers uh, uh, and the final, uh, the final uh, uh, series for the uh, NBA championship, with which they won, and Dave was pretty excited about it. So it's uh, uh, being from being from Cleveland. So it's uh, uh, the at that time I was already involved with uh, Anthony and others uh, in the in the room here today on the uh, strongly sustainable business model group and, and flourishing enterprise innovation toolkit initiative, and actually went to the conference to hear Dave, uh, David's uh, keynote. Uh, I wasn't involved with the CPAP at the time, and, and that's the reason I went to that conference was to uh, to listen to uh, David and hopefully meet him meet uh, David as well, uh, and uh, uh, to share some of the ideas about the uh, uh, the uh, SSBMG and the Flourishing Enterprise Innovation Toolkit Project and, and other things, uh, and, the, and the Flourishing Business Canvas as well. Uh, well, Destiny was on my side that day because uh, the day before, you know, the first day of the conference, uh, I was sitting in the, uh, the, ma the main ballroom with lots of... Uh, you know, lots of empty tables, and uh, thinking about, well, how am I going to actually introduce myself to David and uh, and uh, and you know, get get a chance to talk to him? And uh, and the uh, 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 so I was sitting in this massive room with just uh, all kinds of tables, and I was sitting at one table by myself, and there might have been one other person. And then as I'm talking to the other person, this person walks behind me and, and sits down beside me, and, and of course I, I turn to my right. And, and it's it is David and I went okay this is this is just too good a day so destiny was on my side that day uh, the uh, and really uh, for today just uh, you know it's three years later and and here he is uh, working with us on exploring ideas around the flourishing enterprise Institute so very very exciting uh, a little bit of information on David uh, uh, he's got a pretty extensive bio and, and it's uh, it's uh, I'll just do a few highlights here and hopefully I didn't press uh, David is a distinguished university professor at Case Western Reserve University and holds two chaired uh, professorships at the Weatherhead School of Management. That's the Char and Chuck Fowler Professor of Business as an agent of world benefit and the, uh, I used to say the Fairmont Central, but now it's Covia, Covia uh, uh, David uh, Cooper Editor, Professorship and Appreciative Inquiry. David is the founder of and faculty director at the Fowler Center for Business as an agent of world benefit. Also, uh, David's the honorary chairman of the uh, Chaplin College uh, uh, David L. Cooper Writer Center for Appreciative Inquiry at the Robert P. Steller School of Business. Um, David has also served as an advisor to many prominent leaders in business and society, including five presidents and Nobel laureates. Uh, he has worked uh, with a large number of uh, major corporations, governments, uh, global governance organizations, and not-for-profit organizations. Uh, David has been recognized for his work many times. Uh, re recently receiving the Life, uh, Lifetime Achievement Award uh, from the Organizational Development Network for his work in Appreciative Inquiry and his advancement of the concept of full spectrum flourishing, which we'll hear about uh, this morning. Uh, David has published more than uh, 25 books and authored over 100 articles. I, uh, I, I was asking him this morning whether he wanted to update me in the numbers, uh, but I, I think since it says over, uh, over those numbers, I'm sure there's more now, but uh, um, Every, every, so every time I look at his bio, I just go, wow, and, you know, and it's just, uh, and every time I see him speak, it, it's the, the same, uh, the same experience. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a great experience. Uh, he's a great example of multidisciplinary thinking, bringing together concepts from a variety of fields, including organizational design and uh, my favorite, positive psychology, and many other fields uh, to help and address today's global and local challenges and opportunities. Uh, another example of his, uh, his, this multidisciplinary approach is that David is also a founding member of the International Positive Psychology Association and has worked with the uh, founders of the, uh, uh, of the field of positive psychology. So for me, uh, David is sort of a living example of uh, flourishing in life and in work. And uh, uh, it's a mo he's a, mo a model for me and, and, uh, and what he does and, and making positive impacts at all levels. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. David Cooperwriter. Thank you, Bill. It's um, 
it's really exciting to be with you here today and, and meeting everybody in the early morning session about your commitment to build a, a worldwide movement and to, and to bring all of the different interdisciplinary pieces of this together. Um, I just, I, I, I want to start by, you know, this morning I woke up and thought, what's the word that characterizes best how I feel today? And, and the feeling was gratitude, and that was the word that pumped out. And, and it's gratitude for a lot of things. First of all, just I want to thank the organizers and the thinkers here. When Anthony and, um, and, and Randy and others, we've talked about this, I was, I was compelled to come because of the sense of purpose to really create a worldwide network to elevate the concept of full spectrum flourishing. And so I'm here as an activist, I'm here to participate, I'm here to roll up my sleeves with all of you. My passion in my own work has been around change. I'm in the field of organization development. and. And, and, and my passion really, you know, when I meet with leaders today, whether it's community leaders, neighborhood leaders, um, government leaders, um, corporate leaders, everybody has change on their minds. Change this, change, change, change. But I think in recent years, the real question has shifted. Um, the leadership question today, it's not just simply about change, but it's change at the scale of the whole. You know, how do we move this whole 67,000 person telecommunications company together? How do we move a whole Northeast Ohio depressed economic region for economic opportunity together with 1.5 million people? How do we move a whole United Nations global compact movement together? And that's where my passion is. It's the together part. Um, so that's where I'm going to um, emphasize today. And then the other is that a world of full spectrum flourishing is, I think, a brilliant interdisciplinary nexus. Um, I'm personally going to try and make the links between business sustainability and the positive psychology of human strengths. But I think that the time is right for this effort, and, um, and I applaud um, everybody in this room and, and hope that my thoughts here add at least some small bit to this effort. Um, I'm working on a book I'm just finishing up. We're at my summer cabin in northern Wisconsin. I've got about two chapters left, um, working with my colleague Lindsay Gottwin and kind of really beginning to articulate everything we've learned and it's around the changing world of change the po and the positive organization development. Um, there's three parts to that and the third part is what I'm gonna emphasize most today. But in terms of the book as it's unfolding, the first is all about kind of the revolution, the positive revolution that's happening in the human sciences. Um, many of us know the positive psychology movement, for example. Uh, Marty Seligman, when he called for a positive psychology field um, some years ago, maybe it was around 2000 up at that time, there was just a handful of books and articles in that domain. Today, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of writings and publications and research studies. It's really a tectonic shift. And I just got back from Australia, for example, with a group of 2,000 people um, exploring all the research domains there. But it's really exciting. Um, when Marty began to um, uh, launch this, he looked at about 44,000 journal articles in the field of the human sciences. and 98.7% of those articles were on what's wrong with the human being. It was all a science of human deficit and despair. You know, it was all about codependency and breakdown in relationships and um, on and on and on. And he said, wait a second, maybe we should at least have a 50-50. How about a science of human strength and character? How about a science of human flourishing? Um, that field has just exploded and, you know, um, just there's just superstar work that gives me a sense of hope about what we're capable of as human beings. For example, Barbara Fredrickson's great work on her studies. She won the single largest prize in the history of psychology for her lab studies on what good are positive emotions in human systems, like hope, like inspiration, like joy. Um, I'll go into some of that work in this first um, um, part of the book called The Appreciative Mindset. 
Um, appreciative inquiry has been my area of writing, and I define that as inquiry inspired by life. What is it that gives life to living human and ecological systems when they're most alive? So I'll share a bit about that. One of the great influences for me on the, on the applied side was with um, Peter Drucker. He was 93 years old when I met with him for the last time. And, he wanted to hear all about our work with appreciative inquiry happening in various domains. And, and I said, but Peter, you've written more on leadership and management than anybody in history. Again, 93 years old. It was a, and it was a joy to spend the whole day with him. And he, and I said, at the, and he just, his curiosity velocity was amazing. So at the, I could hardly get in a question, but at the end of the conversation, I said, but Peter, you've written more on leadership than anybody. Can you put it in a nutshell? And he said, David, it's ageless in its essence. The task of leadership is to create an alignment of strengths in ways that make a system's weaknesses irrelevant. And I wrote it down. The task of leadership is to create this alignment of strengths in ways that make a system's weaknesses irrelevant. And that ties in, it's a nice bridge to what is appreciative inquiry. It's a whole set of tools for the elevation of capacities and strengths. It's ways of creating combination and chemistry effects, like planning in a group of 500 to 1,000 and so on. So that whole um, first part is around the appreciative mindset, the search for what gives life. Um, the second part is around the multiplication mindset. How do we think not in terms of just um, like positive psychology, individual strengths, but collective strengths, chemistries of strengths, and so on. And that's where we'll get into change at the scale of the whole. You know, we do planning now with the Appreciative Inquiry Summit method, for example, with groups of 500 to 1,000 people over three days. I'll share a few examples of that. And, and how does it relate to flourishing enterprise and sustainability? What we're finding is the very finest and most powerful appreciative inquiry summits are when people come together to build a long-term vision of a flourishing world. Um, we're developing kind of a new change equation um, where we're saying that it's, people don't resist change, but they resist being changed. And so the real challenge in change is not resistance to change, but it's engagement and this kind of quiet despair we often have about making change happen. Look at our politics today and the way we treat each other and so on. The last part, and that's where I'm gonna spend more of my time today, is the positive institution mindset. When Marty outlined three domains of positive psychology and as a human science he said it should be about the study of positive human experience hope inspiration joy the higher levels of flourishing and thriving he also said it should be about the discovery and typologies and understanding of human strengths like the great book that he and chris peterson did a classification of human strengths but the third is it's all about the study and design the creation and design of positive institutions. And to date, there hasn't been as much work in that area, and that's where I'd like to spend a little bit more of my time. Um, in, in the book, we go into the 10 billion people that are gonna be on this planet by 2050. Three billion new people entering the middle class in the next three years. Um, and the, the, this, this unbelievable, unprecedented call of our time for full spectrum flourishing. For me, the story into this domain started with a surprising call. Um, you know, we, we had been really developing the strength of the Appreciative Inquiry Summit methodologies, and we got a call from Kofi Annan. Um, at that time, Kofi Annan was Secretary General of the United Nations. This was a turbulent time um, as it relates to thinking about business and society and the economy. Um, you can remember Enron and WorldCom and um, and Kofi Annan had a chance to speak at the World Economic Forum during protests all over um, surrounding the building. And during that speech, he did something different. Everybody thought, well, what's the Secretary General going to say to business leaders? And, and during that speech, he started talking about it. And I later talked to him. And instead of joining in that chorus, 
I think in the back of his mind, he's thinking, there's no way we're going to create cultures of peace in high conflict zones without tremendous shared economic opportunity and dignified work. There's no way we're going to make this massive transition to a post-fossil fuel economy, 100% renewable energy economy, without tremendous entrepreneurship and vision and intention and high purpose among business and entrepreneurs and innovators. And there's no way we're going to make this transition. There's no way we're going to eradicate extreme poverty, which we know we can within our lifetime without tremendous dignified work and economic empowerment and so on. So that day he reached out his hands to the leaders and he said, let us choose today to unite the strengths of markets with the power of universal ideals. And let us choose to reconcile the forces of private entrepreneurship with the needs of the billions who live on less than $2 a day. Let us choose. All of a sudden, there was no planned program afterwards, but all of a sudden, Leaders from IBM and Novo Nordisk and Tata Industries and others came up and said, Secretary General, we'd like to have a conversation on this. We need a new vision of business and society for the 21st century. We'd like to work with you on this. Um, we've got about 25 leaders who we think would like to be part of this. Um, they started to discuss it and they opened it up. Then there were 25, then there were 50, then there were 100, then there were 1,000 business leaders from all over the world wanting to participate in this dialogue around business and society for the 21st century. Well, that's when we got the call. Um, Kofi Annan wanted to create a world summit. It became the largest summit in the history of the United Nations. I was so humbled um, and nervous, um, realizing that the stakes were very high. Um, but they called and said, can we use appreciative inquiry as the methodology for helping to launch and grow what's now called the United Nations Global Compact? There's a lot of learning there from the appreciative inquiry perspective. I'll show you a little film clip of the interactions because world summits are typically pre-negotiated agreements. They're talking heads, they're panels, they're, they're everything but collaborative coming together to co-create. Um, so fast forward, three years later, they handed this off to um, Ban Ki-moon. Over a thousand businesses now were part of this effort. Um, our next meeting was in Switzerland and Geneva, um, and I just felt feelings about our time, our privileged time, our time to be here as change agents. I felt things that I had never felt before. You know, I'm sitting there with leaders like Jeffrey Sachs. I, we're at the table. We did the appreciative interviews. We're lifting up innovations and stories of hope and stories of courage and stories of wisdom. And he's pounding the table. You know, Jeffrey Sachs's work probably. He wrote the book. He's the economist at Columbia who wrote the first text that really articulated um, the end of poverty within our lifetime. And he was pounding the table. He was talking about how we can be the first generation in all of human history to eradicate the kind of extreme grinding poverty that we can scarcely imagine or empathize with. So he's pounding the table and he says, I just have to wake people up how close and how much capacity we have in this world to do this. Jane Nelson from Harvard next to him started sharing her stories about equally impressive kind of progress possibilities um, with a, moving towards a, a post-fossil fuel economy. Um, she shared stories of Vienna University where they had done all the studies on and, and invented some new technologies where they could spray solar cells onto windows, windows everywhere. So that, you know, and she said, this is just one innovation. We have everything we need today to move to 100% renewable energy, even with no new technologies. Then there were people that um, kind of got inspired by this, like Jody Berg. Um, you can see her Vitamix there. She's one of my favorite executives. She's in Cleveland, um, and Vitamix is, is leading a health industry and the nutritional excellence. And I drink my green smoothie every day now <laughs> because of the work with this organization. But what I notice is the passion in these organizations as this high purpose begins to set in. Bob Stiller on the lower right, Bob um, was at that summit as well, and, um, and Bob created Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, almost single-handedly created the fair trade movement. 
his process of planning was to bring the peoples from all over the world, from Costa Rica and Nicaragua, into the strategic planning of the company. Um, we started working with them, and he had meditation centers way ahead of his time. He believed in personal growth and development of every human being. He would do planning with the uh, you know, truck drivers and dock workers um, together with the senior leaders and board and so on. Anyway, it was no accident that his company was about 150 million in sales when we started working there. Um, but it was no accident that 10 years later, it was worth $24 billion. So I began to see and sense that this just isn't an incremental process here that's beginning to happen. Um, this is not the incremental kind of improvement that typically we talk about in CSR and so on. Um, when I was in Switzerland that night, um, after all of these conversations with Jeff Sachs and others, I could hardly fall asleep. I felt a sense that there is a, there is a privileged moment op operating here. And I fell asleep with the question, what are they going to call our generation someday? Our generation of leaders, researchers, um, development people and communities and so on. And I, and I, the book, Tom Brokaw's book, the title came into my head, The Greatest Generation. And I thought, no, that's not it. I said, it's not the greatest generation, but a privileged generation. There is a privilege to be alive at this time of creativity, of commitment, of people coming together. Um, I don't think it is um, um, utopian or beginning to, or at all to think about and look like Jeffrey Sachs did at our moment. You know, we probably will see the end of extreme grinding poverty of the kind that the World Bank describes and so on within the next 10, 20 years. Um, we will see a world of 100% renewable energy. I'm so convinced of it now. I'll share the stories with Mark Jacobson. Uh, we're moving towards ecologies and circular economies that literally bloom. I'll share stories there. Um, the idea of education available for every child in our world. You know, these are progress moments that we don't track very often. But for example, um, about, let's say, 16 years ago, what percentage of the world's children all over the world had access to school, do you think? How, what percentage of children? At that time, it was about 41%. What do you think it is now, about four, 16 years later? Huh? 92%. 92% of the world's children have access to education. So I think we're, we're going to see a lot in our lifetime. Let me just show you a little clip from that first summit um, and then talk about the progress that's happened and one big opportunity as we think about building this um, network for full spectrum flourishing. This is the largest, highest level gathering of leaders from business, labor, and civil society ever held at the United Nations. Four years ago, fewer than 50 companies met here at the United Nations to launch the Global Compact. Today, nearly 1,500 firms participate from 70 countries. We want to connect with the innovation. We want to connect with your deepest and best thinking. We want to connect with the innovations and lessons and insights from your own work and experiences. The world is going through stress right now, I think, uh, on the issue of peace and security. And, uh, you know, this is one area in which certain the business can commit to changing the world. This is not philanthropy, it's not public relations. There is a real way of aligning long-term competitiveness with what customers want, what the needs are in growing the market, what employees want, and even what the investment community now is beginning to want. For most people, and for the governments they elect, the global village remains a distant and abstract concept, even though everybody's life is profoundly shaped by it. We are still tied up in ideas from long ago and in behavior and institutions that are being left behind by events. Business, government, NGOs working together, I mean, that's what has to happen. And it all starts with 
communicating and talking together. If we weren't here, we wouldn't be having those dialogues. Well, I think we have unique opportunities through the compact to make important progress in areas that will determine what kind of place this planet is to live on in the next 10 to 20 years. So as I look at that and how it's grown and how that network has grown and so on, it brings up lots of thoughts for me. Maybe tomorrow I'll share and get into the practical thoughts of that kind of network that's grown and grown in a kind of a viral way. Um, but the, we've done four more summits with that, that group and in partnership with our Fowler Center for Business as an Agent of World Benefit. And I just got back from Switzerland where we sat down with the Assistant Secretary General to the United Nations, Nikhil Seth. Nikhil is the one that organized the Earth Summit um, in Rio, um, uh, Rio 2020, that laid the groundwork for the Paris Agreement. And what we started talking about was the positive psychology of human flourishing and how that's taking this field into another level. Um, we talked about like John Ehrenfeld's concept of sustainability and moving beyond to the larger aim of flourishing for all people and all life over the long haul. Anyway, he got very excited by it and began to propose that maybe it's time to do another world summit um, using appreciative inquiry. Kofi Annan was one of his mentors. Um, he had tears in his eyes when we spoke about Kofi Annan's impact and influence and so on. Um, and so we just signed an MOU um, with them to begin to design and think about a world summit to accelerate the capacity building for the global goals and for flourishing. Now there's a lot of heavy lifting to do before we get there, like we need to raise quite a bit of money. Um, that's going to be the major um, uh, task that we have ahead of us right now. But I want to come back to this maybe tomorrow as a possibility, as part of a, a growth of this flourishing movement. I think it's a real opportunity. So after that, that's when we started our launching our study of business as an agent of world benefit. And it's not an, it's not an answer. It's not a, it's not an assertion. It's a question. What does it look like? Where is it happening? What are the dynamics? What are the enablers? Um, and it has been amazing. If you go to www aim to flourish, what you'll find there, what you'll find there is, um, over 2,100 published stories of innovation. And so many of these stories, I wish were heard by everybody in the world. I'll share just a couple of them because, you know, um, Joseph Campbell, the anthropologist and sociologist said, when you look at society transformations, it's awe that moves us forward. And so many of these stories are not heard in our negative crescendo of the media. Um, what we've done is developed a, a methodology where students all over the world can download the Appreciative Inquiry Guide to surface innovations in their regions, in their homes, in their communities. Um, they knock on the door and they go and they begin these interviews. Um, I think our latest tabulation is now 278 management schools are part of this, um, 88 countries, 9,300 students, 546 professors, and there's over 2,100 published stories. So it's exciting and there's potential with this aim to flourish to actually create an accelerated kind of learning process, a uh, world learning process. Um, so um, as we're getting into this, again, it's not an answer, um, but it's a question. What does it look like? What are the enablers? Um, how far can, can this, how can we begin to see the pattern of the future in the actual, in the texture of the actual? And where we're heading now is towards a world where business can excel, people can thrive, all people can thrive, and nature can flourish. A few examples of the kinds of stories and innovations. So this one was one in, in Rwanda, um, and shortly after the genocide, Hutu and Tutsi genocide, we know what happens in a, like this was a million person genocide, and we know what happens in terms of conflict and bitterness and separation. And so um, one entrepreneur who had a place in his heart for Rwanda, his name was Bobby Sager, he said, what can we do? What can we do through business 
to begin to break that cycle that could last hundreds of years from one generation to the next. And he came up with a, a, a wonderful innovation. He studied the Grameen Bank ideas of, of, of microenterprise and developed a microenterprise bank with his partners in Rwanda. And they did the innovation came around. First of all, they, they earmarked most of the loans for women um, in terms of their business ideas and the economic empowerment. But then they went one step further and said, let's earmark the funds for women who come together as partners, as colleagues, as co-owners of the business across the Hutu and Tutsi lines. Haha, -ha, all of a sudden, the transformations began to happen. And as Bobby said, you cannot demonize the people you're working for and building hospitals together and schools for the children. Anyway, it's an ex interesting example. I'll share a little bit more about why that's so important in terms of the world's $14 trillion a year on military expenditures and conflict and so on. This was an interesting one um, in the Netherlands. I went there and talked to the folks and heard the story about this OAT um, organization. And, and, uh, and they wanted to appeal to young people and they wanted to use products as a way to teach. Um, so they went to their designers and this is where the innovation possibilities come in. Can you design us a gym shoe that's 100% made in renewable energy facilities, that's made from biodegradable materials? And by the way, as we see sustainability moving away from just less, 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 less landfill, less harm and so on, can you design us something that actually regenerates the planet and adds to the planetary health and so on? And so literally, I bought boxes of them home for our kids and everybody loves them, but literally, it's called shoes that bloom. When you're done with them, you plant them in the backyard and it turns into a flower, turns into a, a tree. And it's, 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 a, it's a small business, uh, but the designers there believe that design is all about human intention. What is it that we intend? Um, so anyway, I'm wearing another kind of gym shoe um, today. I just uh, came across this company. It's called Nothing New, Nothing New. And these gym shoes are based on nothing new. It's made out of all ocean plastics, um, fish nets, um, you know, recycled rubber and so on. So anyway, lots and lots happening in that domain. Um, this was one from Indonesia. Um, the students there got into a canoe, went to one of the islands, found an entrepreneur who did care about all of the toxic waste in the oceans, 18 billion tons of toxicity and plastic in our oceans, and P.T. Marta was his name. And he began to do science and work on the tapioca route and discovered that they could create a kind of a plastic simulation out of tapioca root that would biodegrade in 30 days instead of 300 years. Anyway, the students doing those interviews were alive when they came back to teach those stories to their own students. Mark Jacobson at, 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 at at Stanford. He wrote the first cover story, major analysis. I had a chance to talk with him. He's a brilliant, brilliant engineer. And what he did was the, the cover story was all about how we can move to 100% renewable energy future with no new technologies and at a, a job growth um, and at a, a savings for the planet of trillions of dollars a year. Since then, he's gone on to create a plan. It's a 100% clean and renewable wind water plan for 139 countries, including Canada. Um, and so hundreds of corporations are now signing on to the pledge to become 100% renewable from Apple to Ikea to Nike and P&G and hundreds of cities and so on. And I just felt like, okay, so now we're seeing something and I would like to begin to link this with the other tectonic movement that's happening, the positive psychology of human science, the call for a psychology of flourishing and so on. And I thought, how do we bring these two domains together, the business world um, and, and the business side of sustainable value and moving towards flourishing with the great work in positive psychology where the bottom line for all of positive psychology is human flourishing, where everything points in that direction. 
So what I want to share is how, we're, how this leads to a definition of positive institutions. Um, and um, you may have read the Encyclopedia of Human Strengths. We used to have an encyclopedia, of, uh, you know, the Diagnostic Manual of Mental Illness, 10,000 technical terms for what's wrong with the human being. It's only recently that we've had that same kind of typology and scientific effort around human strengths. You know, strengths of courage, like bravery and perseverance, strengths of wisdom, like love of learning and judgment and curiosity, St strengths of transcendence, like hope and spirituality, strengths of temperance and prudence and humility, citizenship, um, teamwork, and so on. And so I started thinking, how do we take this kind of great work and begin to begin to define what we mean by positive institutions. So I want to share a story with you, um, one of the best in our database, um, one that kind of blew my mind and shook my soul. And But as I share this story, this happens to be in the high conflict region in the Middle East, um, what I'd like to do is share this business and society story. But as I share it, think a little bit about what strengths what human strengths do you see in this? What three stand out for you? So I'm on my, my way to Israel to give a talk at the Arison School of Management. Um, on the way, I stopped in Amman, Jordan. Um, it was tense, and there was bombing going on in many places. Um, and while I was at that hotel, I met with the former prime minister there. We were talking about the state of the world and the tensions at the cellular level that you can feel. And that night, there was, um, I woke up to just Bedlam in the morning. Um, there was a, the headlines on the papers, there was a terrorist plot to let go of a biological weapon intended to kill 150,000 people. And I started thinking about my talk as I was going to go to Israel the next day. And so I changed the topic of my talk and I thought, you know what, I'm going to talk about business as a force for peace. I don't have a lot of data. It's the first time I'm talking about this. I'm going to be clumsy for sure, um, but I just felt compelled to shift. And so, um, so I did shift. And what I, as, as I went to the Arison School of Business, I just started my talk. Where's the peace going to come from in this part of the world? I don't think it's going to come from our military. I don't think it's going to come from our lawyers. I don't think it's going to come from our paralyzed senates and knessets and so on. Could it be that business could be one of the most important forces for peace in this part of the world? So again, it was clumsy. I didn't have a lot of data, but, um, but the speech went on. And then afterwards, there was a reception, um, and an elderly man came up to me, tapped me on the shoulder. Later, I found out he was about 85 years old, um, and he said, David, he said, your thesis is right on. He said, um, you know, more than that, I just, he said, um, he, well, then he shocked me. He said, I, I don't know what your schedule is, but could you meet me by my helicopter tomorrow at 8 in the morning? And I said, what? He said, could you meet me by my helicopter at 8 in the morning? I want to take you to the Galilee region. I want to take you to see a community called Tefen. And so that morning, someone said, David, you ought to do that. So I changed my schedule. I met him. It was a beautiful day. I'll never forget how splendid it was. We took off. The Mediterranean is sparkling over here. And then we're shortly going through deserts with no natural resources, just goats on hills. And then way off in the distance, you could see this beautiful, beautiful set of art centers and museums and parks and homes. And he said, that's where we're going. And so we went there, and he landed in the Middle East. And then he began to share with me the vision he had as he earlier when he fled fascist Germany. Anyway, at the center of this community is an entrepreneurship center and hub intended to create, well, they've created 10, they've created um, something like 10,000 new businesses. It accounts for 10% of Israel's export GNP, so real business. But then, this, then the stunning part of it all, every business, every community center, every art center, every part of the schools were all co-owned, Arab and Jewish co-ownership of the schools, co-ownership of the centers, co-ownership of the artwork, and so on. And I said, well, Steph, you know, here I am in a part of the world where everyone says it's intractable. 
the hatred, the bitterness, and so on, and the lack of hope. And he said, let me show you our fourth grade classroom. So here I go into this fourth grade classroom. They're teaching entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship to the young people. But again, it was Arab and Jewish children laughing and singing and holding hands. And, 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 I, and I had tears in my eyes. And I said, Steph, what's your dream now as a next stage? He said, David, if we had, if we had one of these in all of the different um, non-oil producing countries in the Middle East, we'd get rid of the concept of terror. And so anyway, um, other, if you hadn't heard it from me in some other speech or something, how many of you heard that story? None. I thought, this is amazing. Here I am, a management school professor on the lookout for business as a force for peace. And, 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 and I had never heard this story. What's going on, you know, in our news, in our media? Anyway, what human strengths do you see in this story? Courage, okay. What's that? Hope, yep, yep. Love love, the cognitive power of love, and so on. So this was the attempt I was working on to begin to get to a point of, of understanding this. Now, in a practical sense, I mentioned that the world spends over $14 trillion a year on armed conflict and reducing conflict and so on. And I just started thinking, this story should be headline news everywhere in the world. It's not just philanthropy, it's not, it's using business and the tools and the strengths of innovation together. Anyway, um, so this leads to the definition that I wanna propose, my colleague and I, Lindsay Gottwin, um, in our book, go into it more. But we describe positive institutions to link together these fields. Positive institutions are organizations and structured practices in our culture or communities or society that serve to elevate and develop our highest human strengths, combine and multiply and magnify those highest human strengths, and refract, send outward those highest human strengths, outward in a world benefiting ways, leading ultimately to a world of full spectrum flourishing. It's not often that we think of institutions as a vehicle for amplifying and elevating and magnifying wisdom in the world, the human strength of wisdom. It's not often that we think of institutions as magnifying the capacity of love in our world. But that's where I think there's just a lot of research opportunities. And for me, it started making me think, you know, as, a, as an organization development professional working with companies all over the world to help them move towards their higher vision of themselves, I started thinking, you know what? What if we stop thinking about institutions as our clients, but institutions as the change agents? You know, all of a sudden, systems change becomes more of a hopeful reality. All of a sudden, you start realizing the capacities we have in over 214 million businesses that encircle the planet, and, and how to harness this $80 trillion economy in a better way. And all of a sudden you start thinking about what does that mean for the world? What does that mean for the business? I had um, just a recent visit um, at several of the display centers for Tesla um, and the courage that they have and so on. So the one I was at was in Amsterdam and it was filled with young people who were so sharp and so passionate and so articulate and one of the young people, I said, okay, at the display center, tell me, you know, I'd like to know, what is your job here? And he said, David, my job is to electrify the renewable energy age. And I said, okay, that's grand, but what's your job? What's your task? What do you, what's your work here? And he said, David, my job is to electrify the renewable energy age. And I guess I didn't quite get it yet. And I said, well, wait, well, how, how would you describe to your mother what you do? And she said, he, she said, my mother's so proud of me as I'm helping to electrify the renewable energy age. 
So anyway, there's something going on in all of these organizations as they adopt the sustainable value and flourishing agenda and call their people to craft it, like at Bob Stiller's, where he'd have 600 people in the room designing the fair trade movement for coffee and so on. And so um, my colleagues at the Weatherhead School at the Fowler Center for Business as an Agent of World Benefit connected, Chris Laszlo, um, um, Aaron Feld came together, a um, whole series of scholars came together to begin the research on companies that have kind of hit the wall. And why did they hit the wall at, with so much energy at the beginning around sustainability? And then they hit a brick wall and find incremental gains. Like there's only so much waste you can get rid of, you know, less, 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 less. They wrote a wonderful book called The Flourishing Enterprise with lots of definitions and so on, and had some pretty um, amazing propositions about it. Um, it could be because, you know, most of the time, so what they proposed was that a lot of companies start in the middle here. They start trying to develop a sustainable enterprise. They look at their waste. They look at their um, ways to improve productions and so on. And what they find is that that just lasts a little bit of time. What they began to articulate in their research was the need for deep personal transformation. In a lot of the interviews with the CEOs, like a Bob Stiller and so on, there was just, uh, what they were noticing was a lot of time spent, they call it a consciousness of connection, a consciousness of our interdependent world, a worldview of intimacy and so on. And so they argued that the sustainability word is wrong, that we need to advance to full spectrum flourishing, that, you know, sustainability isn't motivating. Like you don't start a new partnership or marriage by turning to your, you know, at the wedding vows and saying, I hope we have a sustainable marriage, you know? And so, so they argued, but where is this gonna go? Where is this gonna come from? It's not the business case, they argued. Um, and so they argued for a whole series of reflective practices, and the book is filled with all different kinds of reflective practices from mindfulness to, you know, um, journaling and so on. And, and it's, it's, it's really caught the attention of a lot of people. What they're arguing is that it, when it comes from this inner core, then you could begin to work the sustainable enterprise on the inside and build all the sustainable systems and so on. And then ultimately, you can cast your attention outward into the world um, and doing the outer work and building a better world. Now, I wrote the last chapter to this book, and I agree with everything that they're talking about, but I also agree about systems thinking. And so I just want to share a concept that we emerged in this um, last chapter around mirror flourishing. So again, the argument was that as we help individuals begin to flourish as a whole human being, capturing every part of their, their spirit, their heart, their mind, their, and so on, then we can begin to work towards a flourishing enterprise, kind of on the interior of the enterprise, and then move towards the flourishing world. That's true. But one of the things that we realize from systems thinking is that we kind of get into trouble if we don't think in circles when we forget to think in circles. And so one of the things that I began to look at, I did a series of speeches with Marty Seligman throughout Australia. Um, he talking about individual flourishing and the science that was emerging and myself talking about the enterprise and larger systems. And what I realized that all of the stories I shared were of companies that began not just looking at themselves, internal gazing, but committed themselves to some significant outside work. Um, for example, like the Bob Stiller organization and the fair trade movement and bringing all the people from around the world to help develop the plans and culture there. So what we're seeing is, you know, you've got a normal enterprise and you want to launch an effort towards a positive institution, flourishing enterprise. So one way is the, the, from the individuals to the enterprise to the world. But what our research is showing is that it might be more simple. 
that, that, that we can just jump to action learning engagement in the real world and begin to develop um, a flourishing world. And then what we're seeing happening, and I'll show you Bob Easton's dissertation on it, then what we're seeing happening is the passion, like that young Tesla employee, you know, I'm here to electrify the renewable energy age. He's building this flourishing transition of a world. And so um, what we're seeing is that it can be this simple as jumping right there, and then it moves to the flourishing individual and the desire for deeper development, the desire for um, greater consciousness, and then the flourishing enterprise systems and operations and products and so on. And then again, it feeds back into a flourishing world. Calling that dynamic mirror flourishing. And the idea is that is, is very powerful. Um, and I think what's happening here is a reverse PERMA dynamic. So Marty uses the acronym PERMA to describe and define flourishing at the individual level. P stands for a life, a good life of positive emotion, of hope and inspiration and joy. Um, e stands for engagement of our signature, who we are as a human being, our gifts, engaging those gifts. R stands for life-giving, growth-promoting relationships. M stands for a life of meaning and purpose beyond the self. And A stands for accomplishment. And when those are high within an individual's life, they're said to be flourishing or moving into the direction of, of flourishing. And so what we're seeing is it's it, that, that in these organizations, the great opportunity is to amplify this flourishing dynamic by t actually taking our attention away from something. It's kind of like obliquity. Sometimes you go after something so directly, like trying to go to sleep. <laughs> the harder I try to go to sleep, the less able I am to go to sleep. Some things are like that, like when um, Mandela and others were working on the end of apartheid and I had a visit there, I couldn't understand why none of them were talking about the end of apartheid. And I said, why are we not in any of these meetings talking about the end of apartheid? They said, our job is to create one of the finest multiracial democracies the planet has ever seen. That's our job. Apartheid is already dead as an idea in people's minds. So I was intrigued by that as it relates to this kind of work and why we need this shift from sustainability as less harm to actually beginning the act of moving into what um, Joanna Macy calls active hope. Active hope, not empty hope, but out there. Um, so here's an example of an organization that is moving um, as a, 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 in the direction with the intention to become a fully flourishing enterprise. It's Clark Industries. It's a very toxic industry that they were in. Um, it has to do with vector control, disease control from mosquitoes and other kinds of things. Um, you know, they were very much on the front line with the Zika virus in Brazil and so on. But they deep down knew that all of this toxicity was no good. Lyle Clark decided, I want to build a sustainable, flourishing enterprise. He read Chris's book and others' book. And he said, I don't know how we're going to do it. He brought his leaders together, um, and they, they went around a swimming pool, and he said, I just want to take the leap. And they jumped into the pool and said, we don't know where we're heading with this. But then they started to talk about what it would mean to move towards regeneration and becoming this larger agent of health and benefit. And again, what I'm talking about here is how easy it is to spark this mirror flourishing um, process. So Clark Industries, um, following the work that they began called Project Greater Purpose, like how about bringing a thousand people into the room to begin to articulate our higher purpose together and, and jump into that pool with an unknown destination um, so I want to show you just the energy at one of their summits in terms of whole system in the room, where somehow wholeness is what brings out the best in human beings. You know, having the customer in the room, having the dock worker, having the shipping agent, having the marketing person. And while it seems like that could be very complex, 
what we're finding is the very best in human behavior and interaction comes out when you bring wholeness together with an agenda around flourishing. So here's just a little glimpse of their summit. I feel so fortunate to be part of the journey that you're on. I mean, it is incredible. I think you are the company of the future. So for the next three days, ask yourself this question. How do we bring more of the heart of Clark to the world? Yeah, I think using appreciative inquiry and especially including everybody into that process is unbelievably valuable. Rather than working for a company who tells me what I need to do on a daily basis, my thoughts, my opinions um, are valued and I actually see them put into action. They are actually hearing from the ground up as opposed to taking direction from top down. You know that it's involving people at the field level all the way up through accounting and throughout every aspect of our business, you're hearing from every unit. So any themes that come through are clearly themes that matter to everybody. We'd like Clark to be the go-to entity for the CDC and WHO for rapid response to global outbreaks. So one of the most exciting things that happened this morning was the number of people that brought up water management. And of course, aquatics is part of our company, but it's a small part. And yet you could see the importance that it played in all the groups that got up there and gave their presentations. Really something that we probably didn't think would happen, but it has come to the forefront in my mind. Clark website of the future for Clark Aquatic Services. We want to be at the forefront. Let's do what it needs to take to get in front of the forefront. This is it. How many of you saw some ideas and some future in Clark that really attracted you, you know, that you said, this is the kind of Clark I want to work for. I think it's great that they're a family-owned company and that they've stayed together as a family in the second and third generation. And they continue to do that as a family together. And that's so important and so rare nowadays. If I was to call somebody out, it would be my dad. He was all about product innovation. And that's where the, really the heart of this company is. And he was the one that started that, so. What gets me excited is that they have taken sustainability and they've owned it. And I think now they're moving past sustainability. If they stay with sustainability, they'll be stagnant. And I think there's like this new wave of them setting the standard of uh, regeneration. I just think that the best thing has been that everybody is, is seeing the culture change and, and going with it. There was some talk about rapid response vehicles and mobile units and we have went ahead and made a prototype for that. I'm very fortunate to interview Lyle Kelvin Clark, CEO of the Clark Group. I understand just in the corporate culture that you sit around a lot and just like a lot, talk a lot and cool by uh, with everybody. And, you know. I think this event made the whole company realize that we can be the um, agent of world health. And I don't think we thought that big before. I really see that there's almost uh, unlimited potential here for this company to impact the world in a better way. I wouldn't be shocked if this company were to grow a hundredfold. So when we look at the prototypes that were developed three years ago in the first Appreciative Inquiry Summit, for example, whole new buildings that model sustainability, you know, people may have thought maybe that will not take place, but within three years it exists. Bolder, bigger, braver. Bolder, bigger, braver. Bigger, bolder, braver. Bolder, bigger, and braver. So the, the concept we def began to define, mirror fur flourishing, suggests this intimacy of relations between entities to the point where we can posit there is no outside or inside, only the creative unfolding of in the entire field of relations or connections. 
Martin Buber talked about this in I and Thou, is that in the beginning is this fundamental interrelatedness. And I think that's why going to the outside so quickly can help begin to mobilize the inside of the flourishing on the inside. Rasha Sodia, he's on our board, um, wrote the book Firms of Endearment and looking at just the tremendous business um, 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 capability that emerges when you have people at every level that are alive and searching for innovation and so on. Um, it's a good book. Um, you contrast the growth rates of the firms of endearment like Whole Foods and others um, to the good to great firms, that classic that Jim Collins did, and just found almost a 14 to 1 ratio in terms of stock growth and capacity. So the numbers are emerging in a business case. Um, this one's the Temkin Group, and they're, they're looking at authentic engagement compared to disengaged employees. Um, authentically engaged, like coming into the inner circle of strategy, you know, where everybody, every voice is part of that inner circle, are 480% more committed to helping their company succeed, 250% more likely to recommend improvements, 370% more likely to recommend their company as an employee of choice and less likely to be absent. So part of this network and research and applied research network is that we, you know, we need to also look at this business case. And I think it's a tremendous one. I don't think it's incremental. Um, there's a lot of theories to draw on around this mirror flourishing idea, co-regulation, um, emotional contagion, conscious co-elevation, where we consciously see the best in the other, um, resonance theory like Richard Boyatzis's, the reciprocity re reflex, how reflexive that is, um, the biology of super cooperation and swarms and quantum connectedness. I love this kind of spiritual quote from Rumi, indicating this kind of quiet that we need to feel that, we need to feel it in our lives. He said, stay here quivering with each moment like a drop of mercury. So what I'd like to do is just show one more quick clip. Let me go forward a little bit on this um, about this whole system in the room idea. Um, these are some of the success factors of the appreciative inquiry. It's not top down or bottom up. What's not top down or bottom up? It's whole. It's, it includes top down, includes bottom up. Um, it, it, it includes the universe of strengths. Um, high purpose. It uses a lot of design thinking and so on. And then there's a kind of a, a sustainable value matrix that we use with Chris Laszlo to ways the company can reduce risk, build efficiency, better products like the shoes that bloom. And it's, it's just, we're working it with whole cities and states. Um, here's an example from Cleveland. It's called building a green city on a blue lake. And I'll and with one thought after this. Mayor Jackson launched this, this room up. Sure, how they're doing this for 10 years in a row. I just can't tell you how excited and happy I am to be a part of what is going to be looked back on the history. The summit is about, is about acting on something. Not just having a conversation, it's about doing something. Doing something for our future, not waiting on someone else to determine what that is. The mayor bringing together all these people is just, it's unprecedented. It's never been done before. Sustainability is not just a concern of the environment, it's an opportunity uh, for economic development. Where there's a will, there's a way, and there's apparently great will here in Cleveland. Cities are so central and why it's so important for sessions like this to come together, and not just come together, but to commit themselves to a course of action that really puts our country uh, on a different trajectory. The really uh, positive examples of change I can think of are when people kind of get it together to start living together differently locally. Um, it's a process where because the people create the vision, um, they automatically see their role what role they have to play in making sure that the vision gets accomplished. This moment is so different. What we've learned from the past, what we've learned from past strategies and programming has taken us to this point. It's a so different time. But now it's all possible. I might not have believed that 20 years ago, but now I do. We're creating that vision collectively with 700 people in the room 
rolling up our sleeves, everything that we've done today and the past two days has never been done before in Cleveland. The energy that is in this room is so positive, it, it's, it's so rewarding to be part of this process, and it's one of those things that you're just so proud to be from Cleveland. So there's enough passion and commitment in this room that, that that's going to happen, that we're going to be able to, to harness what we've, what we've put together here and that momentum and move it forward. Just end with this um, comment around all of this. Um, you know, as as I'm involved with these communities and ways of bringing people together, yes, the wholeness part of it, but combined with flourishing, it just creates this mirror re resonance, and it's incredible to see. My sense of hope about what we're capable of just goes up and up and up. And after one of my recent talks, um, an elderly man raised his hand in the crowd. I was raising the question, why would wholeness bring out the best in human beings and their relationships? Why would wholeness, you know, we've created such separations and bitterness and hierarchies. Why would wholeness? And anyway, he raised his hand. He said, Professor Cooper, I believe in this concept of wholeness. Let me introduce myself. I'm chief of the Embara Indian tribe in Panama. And he said, and every year we bring all 3,000 of our people together for three weeks and we sit in circles and we celebrate our work. We celebrate our children's future. We celebrate our ancestors. And he goes, and you know, every time we do it, it brings out the very, very best in our system. It's so healing. And then he said, and with a smile, we've been doing it for th for over 300 years. <laughs> and I thought, oh gosh, it's great for our field to be at the cutting edge, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, I look forward to working with all of you on building this worldwide network to spread this idea of full spectrum flourishing blows that is a, an applied research agenda, as well as, a, a, as something that our world is calling for and we're really ready. I think, um, I think I, I, I'm just feeling like Paul Hawkins' notion of blessed unrest, that we are in a moment where people just want, they feel it in every cell of their body. So thank you for inviting me. Um, thank you for your vision. And I look forward to our work rolling up our sleeves the next couple days. Thank you. that has uh, uh, set us up uh, very nicely for what's going to happen next. Let me just get to the last few slides at the end here. Uh, for those of you who were online, uh, the slides, um, a PDF of these slides and the videos are already in the Dropbox, uh, sorry, in the Google Drive folder for the SSBMG. So that's drive.ssbmg.com. Thank you. Uh, let me see if I can get there quickly, more quickly there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this, that's the one I want to have there. Yeah. Okay, so, um, we, um, so for the, we have two groups of people in the room, which perhaps we didn't make clear. There's the uh, 26 participants of the founding forum for the Flourishing Enterprise Institute, and then there's also uh, a number of uh, guests here from the region. Um, and uh, we wanted to close with some uh, uh, questions for you all to start to ponder. So uh, for those of you who are guests, you're welcome to take these away. Uh, you're welcome to start talking to your colleagues about these questions. Uh, and uh, we would be really interested uh, th back through uh, Randy and through uh, Tova at Sustainable Waterloo Region to start to hear your responses to those questions. Uh, for those folks who are uh, involved in the founding forum, uh, we're gonna now spend the rest of the next two days uh, exploring all of these ideas that we've just heard. Um, and uh, these are the questions that are going to tr start that process uh, in this uh, questions that David's uh, handing out. Um, and um, so the um, the in the institute's commitment is to be useful to leaders who choose to strive to enable flourishing, and we hope that this event is going to establish that uh, future sharing and building on the. Uh, uh, traditions that the SSBMG has set up for trying to convene the, the system in the room and to, to do the sharing there. So um, we're going to walk now, those of us involved in the founding forum, we're going to walk from here to Evolve One, which is